sympathy and patriotism that uh, are uh, pro-social, that uh, cause us to uh, 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 innately favor uh, 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 institutions and norms that are good for our, uh, good for our group, that, that make groups, uh, uh, societies a going uh, concern. And so uh, uh, there's a psychology adapted to acquiring uh, uh, norms and identification with groups. So this is something that uh, uh, social psychologists tell us, that uh, people identify, part of your uh, identity as an individual person is, uh, is the groups that you belong to. And uh, at the same time, kids are, are, uh, are uh, really uh, easily pick up uh, rules and, and uh, uh, so norms are something that kids are, are uh, as it were, uh, adapted to acquire. And then the further cultural evolution involves norms and social institutions, uh, uh, and there's continuing group selection, uh, uh, and I'll talk about three different forms of group selection, and that cultural evolution is, is partly driven by these innate pro-social biases like, uh, like uh, sympathy and uh, patriotism. So just a, a, just a comparative sketch of uh, human natural history compared to other apes are uh, where humans are uh, exceedingly docile. Uh, I mean, you get pictures like this. This is Kanzi, the famous language competent uh, ape, and Sue Savage Rumbaugh, her uh, uh, trainer, uh, and a little boy here. Uh, there's like a pane of glass here. He isn't actually uh, 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 touching the, uh, the ape. Uh, uh, so you get these pictures that, uh, uh, that suggest that apes are more or less like uh, like uh, humans, and, and I don't think this is true at all, and particularly with regard to docility and extensive cooperation amongst uh, distantly related and unrelated individuals that you don't get much of in any other ape society or, or all but a handful of any other kinds of society. The groups that we live in are large compared to ape societies, uh, uh, to very large. I mean, by large, I mean hunting and gathering uh, uh, groups uh, or ancestral kind of, of economies in which uh, the tribes were on the order of a thousand uh, individual. That's still very large compared to primate uh, troops that are usually under a, a hundred. Uh, there, of course, our societies are imperfect and conflict ridden. We don't want to uh, uh, make them out to be uh, uh, more cooperative than they really are. So we have to account for uh, those imperfections as well. And, and th these socially transmitted rules regulate uh, uh, social life. Uh, so chimpanzees uh, are really not very docile at all. So there are these uh, uh, many tragic examples of people trying to raise chimpanzees as if they were children. They get their hands on a young chimpanzee and they raise it up. And, and by the age of about 24 months or so, uh, these animals become impossible. And, and this is Mo uh, here uh, was a human raised uh, chimp and, and, uh, and, uh, and so what he did, where he lives now is in jail uh, as you can see there he lives in a cage in a in a uh, in a uh, in a column and people going to business taking these animals off uh, people's hands and and keeping them in in cages and this is a tragic incident where uh, the uh, Mo's uh, human parents came to uh, uh, give him a birthday cake and two other chimpanzees got out. Actually, actually it's more than two other chimpanzees. One of them was a female and two of them were males chasing this uh, estrus female and they ran across Mo's uh, uh, parents and, and the guy got pummeled and uh, Mo's human dad got pummeled and, and beaten and part, his various parts ripped off and, and eventually died. So uh, I had a email conversation uh, with France Duval a few years back in which I analogized uh, uh, chimpanzees to human psychopaths, homicidal maniacs, and, and he uh, uh, objected considerably to this characterization huh. of, uh, of chimpanzees, but... Uh, surprise, surprise. Surprise, surprise, right. So uh, he's one of the people who uh, has a kind of a warm and fuzzy uh, picture of uh, chimpanzees, but uh, I remain convinced that uh, the closest human analog to the average chimpanzee is a, is a sociopath. And the, the sort of basis for this, uh, uh, Francisco talked about um, these yesterday about uh, uh, stable mating bonds in, in humans. And <coughs> so uh, uh, chimpanzees with this uh, fiercely competitive uh, societies where males compete for uh, uh, females. So this is a, a dissection. This is a chimpanzee's uh, brain. That's his testicles, one of his testicles. So. Uh, uh, chimpanzees have 
uh, really giant uh, testicles by our standards. Uh, I can't get, if anybody has any uh, uh, connections with a pathologist or someone who regularly dissects <laughs> humans, I... Very small pennies, right? Uh, the penises are very small. No, they're quite large, oh, chimpanzees. Yeah. And, and, and gorillas oh, have okay. very small, uh, so gorillas have stable mating bonds like humans. They, the uh, males have a harem and they, they have uh, uh, quite different uh, anatomy and uh, uh, many apes have, uh, including chimpanzees, have spines on their penis so they, they ram that penis in there and then they uh, erect the spine so, it, they, so a competing male can't really easily tear them loose from the female. I mean it's, uh, uh, it's a pretty X-rated sex life that uh, uh, chimpanzees have. Uh, Sounds like Hollywood or something. <laughs> excuse me? Yeah, Hollywood, yeah well, yeah Hollywood. So this is, I couldn't get a diagram that is parallel to this, so if anybody uh, knows a pathologist that I might prevail upon to get a, a human testicle and, and human brain in either hand to parallel with that. <laughs> uh, this is the best I could do. So, you know, a human uh, uh, brain is about three times the size of uh, a chimpanzee brain, and our testes are, uh, are what? They're about the size of a walnut instead of a grapefruit. So. Uh, uh, all of the hormonal uh, uh, correlates of that are uh, make uh, human uh, social life uh, quite a bit uh, different. So uh, just an aside on cooperative behavior. So the definition here is that cooperative behavior increases the average payoff uh, uh, of a group but decreases the payoff to individuals. So this is one of the things that we need to, to explain. Uh, how do we, uh, we get uh, humans that can uh, uh, incur uh, costs to maintain their uh, groups. And there are many ethnographic examples of, uh, of cooperation. There's food sharing. Uh, this is a, uh, a Kalahari uh, San camp, and there's a guy butchering the animal. Uh, he's not the hunter. The man who uh, butchers the animal is a, is a third party. And the owner of the carcass, uh, by the way, uh, 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 that San counted is not the man who shot the animal, but the arrow, the maker of the arrow that uh, killed the animal, and they trade arrows around. So uh, uh, <coughs> the, the responsibility for the kill is, is diffused, and the, and the carcass is divided more or less equally. Men are not allowed to uh, divide the carcass of the, of the animals that they kill, and uh, so this is. <coughs> and well, there's a long story behind why. Uh, these, this wide distribution of meat, and it has to do with the, the hunter-gatherers are running a little kind of in, uh, insurance pool uh, because the returns to hunting big game, for, even for expert hunters, are extremely variable. And so there, uh, several, a camp has several uh, uh, master hunters in it, and so the flow of uh, meat to the camp is fairly steady because it, uh, they're averaging out the variance, and, and many other parts of uh, of hunter-gatherer life are involved in this kind of little uh, self-insurance scheme. And then there's participation in warfare, and, and even these ceremonial, uh, uh, so-called ceremonial wars in New Guinea where uh, uh, <coughs> they're semi-ritualized, there's still uh, guys get hurt and killed, and, and so uh, 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 men are incurring uh, big risks to uh, uh, defend uh, groups. Uh, <coughs> Uh, the division of labor and trade uh, uh, in, involve a lot of trust of, of agents that are participating in these uh, uh, long distance uh, trading schemes here. Tibet salt and other <coughs> commodities are, are traded. So, uh, and the enforcement of moral rules. So there's third party uh, punishment of moral rules, uh, uh, strong reciprocity in, in, in Herb's uh, uh, terms. And so uh, people take it on, the set on themselves to enforce uh, He looks like he's rules. so happy about to stab someone. <laughs> well, this is a, a misdemeanor. Fish, this is a fish spear, but uh, 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 it's not obvious that he's going to punish anybody right there. But the, uh, the Eskimo or uh, uh, Inuit people are, are famous for, uh, uh, for punishment. Uh, so uh, Francisco showed this uh, 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 quote uh, yesterday as well, uh, and so the, it's the, this uh, famous quote from the uh, Descent of Man in which Darwin uh, argues that uh, in primeval times that uh, process of uh, group selection operated on, on humans at the tribal level to, uh, to favor these pro-social uh, 
instincts, so patriotism, uh, uh, sympathy, fidelity, obedience, courage, and so on. So uh, th this was his model. And uh, uh, so the, what uh, Rob and I have done is, is to try to modernize this uh, argument. And then, so the second part of, uh, of Darwin's uh, uh, ideas about moral progress were that uh, in primordial times we got these instincts like sympathy and patriotism. And then those in turn uh, acted as, uh, as biases in cultural evolution so that we adopted uh, norms and institutions that, uh, uh, that favored uh, 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 better and better functioning societies, larger scale. So uh, we went from hunting and gathering tribes to bigger tribes to states and, and uh, justice systems and things like that. So there was a, a possibility of moral progress by uh, uh, <coughs> establishing, as he says here, uh, uh, high standards of excellence, uh, laws, customs, traditions, uh, in my terms, is norms and institutions that favor better functioning of, uh, of societies. And so there's a, a, a cultural evolutionary process that then ensues based upon, in part, upon these uh, uh, social instincts. Now, uh, uh, so the, the basic hypothesis then we call the tribal social instincts hypothesis and the, uh, the, the idea is that there are these ancient social instincts still in us. So there's our inner chimpanzee that uh, sometimes it can behave quite uh, selfishly, uh, struggles for dominance are not unknown in human societies, uh, the one percent and all that. Uh, 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 and there's lots of nepotistic cooperation in, in which uh, people's uh, uh, loyalties are, are narrowly restricted to their uh, families oft times and uh, when, when norms and institutions uh, don't uh, correct for that. And then these tribal social instincts evolved by uh, gene culture coevolution. So the argument here is that it's cultural variation, not genetic variation, that must have been the target for this uh, uh, for this group selection process, and I'm going to uh, uh, go through that argument in, in a little bit of detail uh, just Im immediately. And maybe you're going to come to this, so uh, if so, just put it off. But um, if you and I recognize that by cooperating, we can both benefit, and we enter into some agreement, um, we, cooperation emerges, doesn't involve um, group selection. Well, uh, certainly uh, individuals and in small parties can make agreements, right. Now, uh, one of the things that facilitates that in humans is, is language. Uh, uh, but language itself is something that uh, uh, testifies to uh, uh, pro-social uh, dispositions. You, I mean, you couldn't have language unless, uh, unless people tell the truth most of the time. So that when, uh, when you and I uh, establish some agreement, uh, you promise to do something and I promise to do something else in return. Uh, uh, we uh, would tend to trust one another uh, in that, but that's because we have these uh, uh, pro-social instincts, it seems to me, and we're prone to trust uh, 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 other people, and we can make uh, language-based agreements, handshake agreements that uh, are by and large people uh, maintain. But there's a, uh, it seems to me there's a, these tribal social instincts are in the background uh, behind language and behind those kinds of agreements. So uh, is that a reasonable answer to your question. <clears throat> and so uh, there's this uh, 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 cultural uh, group selection process, I argue, or we argue, and there's also the evolution of symbolic group boundaries. So uh, uh, groups become bounded by, uh, uh, by different languages, different styles of dress, and, and so on. So uh, uh, we get uh, 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 real uh, social units. And there's a, uh, as I, the argument I've made here is that there's a kind of a moral hidden hand in operation. Uh, humans often take group goals as their own. This is just an article of uh, faith and a part of some uh, uh, social psychology. So identify with a group, then the group's uh, uh, goals are, are part of your, your own goals. Uh, so uh, uh, there's a, a tendency then to favor group functional norms and uh, institutions. And then there's, altruism and, and altruistic uh, uh, punishment, this strong reciprocity idea that Herb and others have promoted. So uh, a little background uh, by way of how, uh, uh, how uh, uh, cultural uh, evolution works. So by uh, 
our definition, culture is information acquired by uh, social learning, teaching, imitation, and uh, stimulus enhancement is one of these uh, things that probably works in humans, uh, but it's uh, responsible for lots of simple social learning in other organisms. So uh, a calf follows the mama cow around, and the mama cow goes from uh, the best places to uh, in the environment to, uh, to find food, and the, and the calf following along learns uh, uh, what food is good to eat just by following mom around and being exposed to good stuff to eat rather than bad stuff to eat by and large. And so uh, that can result in, in uh, uh, simple social learning systems. So uh, social learning is, is hypertrophied in, in humans and imitation and teaching become uh, uh, disproportionately important compared to any other animal. So we, uh, we end up then transmitting a massive amount of information from uh, one generation to the next or horizontally among ourselves. Uh, uh, by this uh, uh, system. Uh, so it, uh, given that cultural uh, evolution is a form of inheritance, uh, it's very different in, in, in the patterns of organization from genes. Uh, so for example, there's an, the inheritance of acquired variation. You can have more than two parents. You can survey any number of people before you make up your mind to, uh, what, to, uh, uh, what trait to adopt for yourself. Uh, uh, but it evolves in a basically Darwinian fashion uh, uh, by descent with modification. So the uh, way that Rob Lloyd and I and others have tackled this problem is to, uh, is to uh, uh, try to understand the uh, forces that drive uh, uh, evolution, uh, the analogs of natural selection and so forth that, uh, uh, that are responsible for the, uh, for the change of culture over time. As I said yesterday, we've concentrated on imitation biases, the, the uh, uh, the rules and strategies that uh, that uh, individuals use in, in a, actively acquiring information from other individuals. Uh, uh, we've done less with uh, teaching biases, the active things that uh, parents and others uh, do to uh, inculcate uh, socialize uh, uh, children. So some of these uh, uh, forces are are highly analogous to those that operate in in. Uh, organic evolution. So there's random variation, uh, idiosyncrasies of, of organizational founders, misremembering stuff that uh, uh, that you might have been taught, and uh, so uh, there's uh, certainly plenty of random variation. And natural selection also operates on cultural variation. I mean, if there's heritable variation, then uh, natural selection will tend to go to work on that. So uh, bad habits will get you killed. Uh, uh, tribes that are struggling with each other, uh, uh, the ones with weaker institutions will tend to lose those fights. Uh, poorly run companies go bankrupt. On the other hand, long surviving organizations tend to school the, uh, their employees in, in how to uh, run a good organization. Then they often go off and start uh, uh, startup companies carrying these uh, 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 virtuous norms and institutions to, uh, to new enterprises. But the characteristically different thing about, uh, about human evolution is that we have these uh, uh, decision-making forces, uh, Ron and I call them collectively. So guided variation is just learning from experience and then personal experience and then teaching other people or being imitated by, by other people. I mean, this is what science is all about, right? We're supposed to go out there and, and be original, uh, find new, uh, discover new things, and then we teach them to our students and uh, we write papers and people are, uh, so we try to spread those ideas that uh, we've gained from uh, personal experience. And then there's uh, uh, bias transmission. Uh, uh, d the individuals decide or... Uh, Excuse me for interrupting. Now, the guided variation, you put their learning as the word the dominating sentence. Um, but then there are, perhaps, there are inventions, discoveries, ideas that come from sure. writers and the like, not only from science. But you see, that gives, gives to me the impression that as if somehow the variation comes from heaven and then the rest of us learn with it. No, no. So, so this is. This is individual learning, or uh, but invention, discovery. Uh, uh, this, I, uh, yes, those are, are also uh, uh, they're a kind of individual learning, right? Just a uh, uh, fancier uh, version. I know you imply that. I am suggesting that just putting it in learning as the uh, you know the the, the, the the decisive verb gives the wrong impression. Fair it enough. To be. Say okay. discovery. Discovery, uh, invention, uh, right. 
creation of new ideas, uh, at least new from the point of view of the individual, something that you didn't have before. So, uh, simple individual learning, learning to that, uh, uh, and a new habitat that green fruits uh, actually have sugar in them and are good to eat. Uh, that would be a very simple kind of, uh, of example. And, and uh, inventing a uh, new technique for uh, making ever smaller transistors would, uh, or inventing the transistor in the first place would be a, 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 a fancier version of the same thing. And so biased transmission is uh, deciding or not uh, to uh, adopt new ideas, so you're exposed to ideas that you haven't seen before that aren't part of your existing cultural repertoire, and then you make decisions about whether to adopt those uh, or not. Uh, so that's a, uh, uh, a sort of a sketch of the uh, of forces that uh, might apply to uh, uh, cultural evolution. And there are many uh, biased decision rules. And the, and the, the real point here is that, that these uh, uh, forces in green here, uh, coupling uh, the human decision-making capacity to a transmission <coughs> scheme, uh, has a tendency to make evolution much faster, cultural evolution much faster than genetic evolution, because we're not restricted just to to uh, uh, the chance uh, 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 development of, of favorable variants uh, through a random process and then natural selection, which tends to be a slow process. We can, in principle, uh, uh, someone can uh, discover a, a new idea and uh, uh, half the people in the world may be using it uh, 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 in a year or two or three. I mean, uh, cell phones and things like that, modern technology, uh, uh, fancy things get, uh, uh, discovered and, and manufactured, and, and pretty soon they all they become necessities for a large fraction of the population. So uh, already in the 19th century, uh, the students of, uh, of language evolution, uh, the historical linguists, uh, uh, started drawing trees of the relationship of languages uh, to one another. The uh, Indo-European family de depicted here was the uh, earliest to come in for this kind of attention. And, and these look for all the world like the uh, tree diagrams that Darwin was drawing of the relationship between species at the same time. And, and Darwin and, and uh, Mueller, a historical uh, uh, linguist, uh, both noticed that, that this family resemblance between the, uh, these uh, trees. So uh, uh, of course, <coughs> uh, this, uh, this is about a uh, roughly 7,000 year uh, time to, between Proto-Indo-European and these, uh, and these uh, branch tips on this uh, uh, tree diagram. So uh, again, <coughs> language evolution is quite fast uh, <coughs> compared to what we normally expect uh, uh, the evolution of species to look like, although that can be a lot faster than people uh, appreciate. So uh, uh, making uh, mathematical models of this uh, sort of thing is, is uh, uh, fun and easy. You can model a decision of individuals and uh, uh, model the information transmission from individual to individual, model what happens when individuals use the information that they've acquired to make a living or, or to organize their societies. And you can aggregate over populations of individuals. And, and uh, most of us who uh, are in this business have ad adopted the uh, population genetics tradition, difference equations uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to study the uh, evolution of cultural systems. And just generically, there's an inertial component. Uh, if nothing else uh, is going on, and then imitation and teaching will tend to replicate the uh, uh, culture from one generation to the next. And then things like these bias forces, natural selection, uh, uh, guided variation will tend to change the uh, uh, composition of the population over time, where P represents the, something like the uh, frequency of a particular cultural variant in the population. So we can ask the standard kinds of population genetical questions about what happens over time. So you, uh, typically these models are pretty simple and, and they're based upon some kind of a life history. So we can bring in this uh, uh, phenomenon that uh, other adults besides uh, uh, parents are involved in transmission, for example and uh, other uh, features of the cultural transmission uh, system. So uh, kids may uh, accurately copy their parents, so that'd be unbiased transmission. When they're older, they may uh, have uh, exercise more judgment and selectively acquire uh, uh, <coughs> uh, variants by using these bias forces, and then natural selection can influence uh, uh <coughs> uh, cultural variation as well. So. Uh, 
we can model these uh, decision-making forces. You can write down uh, little models of the psychology involved in these uh, in guided variation and bias forces. It's not hard to, uh, not terribly hard to do. This, uh, <coughs> Rob and I made a sort of a family of bias models that are uh, really based upon the uh, uh, diffusion of innovations literature. E.M. Rogers was a uh, famous applied psychologist who uh, looked at the how innovations uh, diffuse and you could uh, use his ideas as a basis for deriving these kinds of, uh, of bias. <coughs> and so then the uh, cultural group selection theory, the idea is that uh, because uh, the fundamental reason why uh, cultural group selection works is because there's lots of uh, cultural variation uh, between uh, groups and uh, that uh, variation comes in part from the rapid divergence of independent groups because cultural evolution is fast. Uh, you take two groups, uh, uh, you know, Anglo-Saxons, uh, some of whom stayed in, 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 on the continent and became uh, Germans and others uh, came to the British Isles and became uh, English. And so you separate these two ancestrally identical uh, groups and they start to evolve off in different directions and, and uh, pretty soon you have quite a bit of variation. And so the forces of cultural evolution tend to be strong relative to migration is another way of putting it. Uh, <coughs> so that we, it tends to generate a lot of, uh, of variation. Uh, and then there are uh, repeated ga uh, uh, social games are, uh, are subject to having many equilibria typically. So punishment and reputation systems in principle can stabilize anything. So uh, uh, groups will tend to, uh, to generate, uh, in isolation, different uh, uh, social institutions. And this becomes important in a, in a minute. So the, uh, uh, then there are forces that uh, uh, cut the effective rate of cultural transmission. We've studied conformist transmission. So if you tend to go with the majority uh, or with the plurality of people, that will tend then to, you'll tend to discriminate against migrants that come from other groups because they'll be uh, uh, carriers of, of rare uh, norms and, and ideas about institutions. And so uh, uh, conformity will tend to preserve variation within groups and resist the effect of, of migration. Ethnic and other symbolic uh, boundaries have a tendency to do the same thing. You prefer to imitate people or learn from people that are like you in some way or another, or, or just language differences. It's just hard to understand what other people are talking about. It's hard to learn from people who are speaking a uh, different language. Uh, so this means that, the, uh, 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 that uh, cultural variation between groups is more tolerant of migration than, than, than a genetic system would be. So the, the upshot of this is that uh, humans are, are prone to a sort of promiscuous pseudo-speciation. So we make these species-like units, uh, cultures that, uh, that are uh, substantially different one from the other. Uh, tribes and various kinds of tribe-like and nation-like uh, social organizations. And these organizations often compete with each other in various ways, so uh, th that also makes uh, 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 group selection possible. So uh, Rob and I studied three forms of, uh, of cultural group selection. The first is like uh, classic group selection in that there's uh, differential performance of two uh, 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 groups that are competing with one another. Perhaps it's a military competition and, and uh, groups with more cooperation are more pr are likely to win and, and those with less likely to lose and so there's a uh, group replacement process. Of, uh, <coughs> now this doesn't have to be uh, genocidal violence so uh, uh, oftentimes what happens in tribal scale wars is the losing groups kind of break up and, and people that are in the losing group go off and join other groups uh, that uh, uh, <coughs> that uh, where they have friends or relatives. And then they're, uh, you, you might think, re-socialized in these groups to the norms of the, of the host groups. Uh, uh, so you don't actually have to kill very many people to get uh, a strong effect of group selection as long as the uh, number of uh, people fleeing from these poorly performing groups aren't numerous enough to, to tip uh, uh, the, their host groups into a different, into a uh, uh, cowardly, uh, 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 into a, a cowardly system of, of norms. And then there's a, a selective imitation of successful groups. So we see that a lot in the modern world. Uh, every country in the world now, practically speaking, except for Saudi Arabia, I think, and a few other, handful of other societies, has a legislature of some kind, right, based upon, uh, <coughs> upon European models. Now, they don't always operate those, uh, those legislatures in the way that we would consider uh, favorable, but every country seems to uh, uh, need to have a legislature, whether the 
if even if it's just uh, sort of pro forma. Uh, so this is uh, uh, many kinds of Western ideas have spread in the last century or two uh, uh, because of the prestige and success of, uh, of Western societies. This can be a quite rapid process. Uh, this process uh, is uh, tends to be fairly slow according to the best estimates we have of the parameters, the empirical estimates of the parameters that go into the model. And then you can have uh, selective migration into uh, successful groups. So many streams of migrants are moving from countries that are uh, more poorly organized, poorer, uh, into uh, countries that are better organized and economically or politically uh, more desirable. And, and uh, typically immigrants uh, uh, become socialized and after a generation or two there, they become part of, the, of that group. And so countries like the United States and uh, Australia and others have grown into into strong nations by attracting uh, large numbers of, of immigrants. So these are some citations to these models. So the, the one thing that's not up there, um, but seems to me important, has to do with the topology of group structure, and in particular, mechanisms that might enforce boundaries between groups, reducing uh, intermarriage and things. Come to that uh, uh, model that momentarily here. Uh, so, uh, a uh, basic uh, check here is to see if uh, the amount of cultural variation uh, between groups is really uh, more substantial than genetic uh, uh, variation. And so this is from a uh, PNAS paper that one of my students uh, did a, uh, a couple of three years ago. And so this plots uh, from Cavalli, Swartz, uh, uh, et al.'s uh, uh, big 1994 book uh, for neighboring groups. Uh, the uh, FST is the proportion of uh, variation that's uh, between groups relative to the total uh, uh, genetic or cultural variation. Uh, and so this is the FSTs for neighboring uh, uh, groups in Cavalli, Swartz, and Feldman's big uh, volume. And this is uh, cultural data from the, from the uh, World Values Survey. So uh, uh, this, now we have comparable surveys done in many different countries. So again, this is for neighboring groups. How different are they? Uh, in terms of the attitudes that they express on the World Values Survey. And you can see that the, you can just, it, FST is just a variance decomposition, so you can apply it to any kind of, uh, of variation. So it's, there's a, a, at least an order of magnitude more very cultural variation between groups. And, and we argue that this uh, uh, underestimates true intergroup differences because it doesn't deal directly with, uh, with institutional differences. And, see that that becomes important. So in, in response to size question, symbolically marked groups. So human social groups are typically symbolically marked by dialect dress, ritual observances, and style, and that sort of thing. And here's some uh, Australian Aborigines in their, in their uh, painted bodies and so on. Uh, uh, their distinctive uh, sim symbolic markers. This is a funeral that they're uh, engaged in here. And <clears throat> so this might mark uh, uh, cooperative uh, groups. Uh, we've uh, made a couple of different models of this over the years, and the one I'm going to describe for you here is one that uh, Richard McElreath uh, was a principal author on the paper. Uh, so there's a, a social interaction that's governed by one of two, in the model, one of two alternate, alternative social norms. It's a game of coordination, uh, uh, so you prefer to coordinate with people that have the same uh, coordination game rule that you do. Uh, the individual social norm is not observable in this case, so you don't know what their norm is. Uh, 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 but individuals are also comp uh, composed or characterized by one of two observable uh, markers. Uh, so this could be dialect or dress or anything of that kind. Uh, and the markers themselves are neutral. They have no direct payoffs. Individuals are predisposed to interact with those that share the same uh, marker. They're also uh, predisposed to imitate people that are like them according to this uh, uh, a marker. And then the, 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 there are a number of social groups and people sometimes move between these uh, uh, groups. Uh, so with these assumptions, uh, beha there's a, <coughs> initially behavior one is uh, in the simulation is more common in population one, behavior two in population two, and uh, <coughs> uh, uh, but marker one is, is more common in both populations relative to uh, the uh, uh, population in one. So then you get a uh, an evolution like this. Individuals are migrating back and forth uh, uh, between these groups, and so even though the, the uh, uh, red marker is more common in, in both groups at the beginning, uh, eventually these uh, two populations organize themselves in, in such that uh, the uh, blue marker uh, is correlated with uh, uh, 
with uh, uh, behavior two in this population and, and marker one is correlated with behavior one in, in that population. So these symbolic markers evolve to, so that uh, uh, there's, you can, pe people are nearly perfectly assorted here and you can uh, pick the right uh, person to interact with. If this uh, assortment is strong enough, you don't even need uh, uh, geographically different uh, groups. Uh, you can have sort of sympatric speciation if, if you want, and you can get classes or castes uh, within a society. So this might be uh, rich people and poor people are, are butchers and bakers and with uh, different norms, and you can get uh, these uh, symbolic uh, differences. So this is a little bit like the uh, symbolic differences in, uh, amongst, uh, uh, amongst academic uh, disciplines. You can sort out to the, the economists usually wear ties and suits, and uh, not to her, of course. But, uh, uh, you, you can take this into the laboratory. One of my students set this uh, model up in a, in, a, uh, in a laboratory setting with uh, volunteers. And if you, allow the, uh, if you allow the symbolic markers to evolve, then, then uh, uh, people evolve two different uh, uh, markers, and the payoffs to the game increase because people are able more often to uh, coordinate on the proper uh, uh, game of coordination. There's a lot of variation uh, between uh, 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 groups in, in the, this is the public goods game played in, in a bunch of different uh, societies and in some societies there's a lot of, of uh, anti-social punishment, people who cooperate are punished as much as people who don't cooperate. Uh, in uh, lots of societies is completely different from the classic studies that were done in places like uh, Boston and, and uh, Melbourne and Nottingham in, in uh, 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 Western societies. And uh, the, uh, uh, those kinds of societies can easily organize cooperation in, in the laboratory and, and groups that uh, have these uh, 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 antisocial uh, punishment uh, uh, norms uh, have a devil's own time getting uh, cooperation organized in the laboratory. So there's a lot of, uh, of uh, gist here for uh, grist, I guess I should say, for uh, cultural uh, group selection. We can also observe uh, uh, <coughs> microevolution in the field in, in different groups. This is a famous example of uh, Evans Pritchard uh, collected data on the New Air and the Dinka, two tribes in the southern Sudan. They're still in the news all the time because they're the uh, principal tribes in the southern Sudan that's been fighting with the northern Sudan. And so this is a, uh, uh, the new era were expanding at, in the late, uh, in the 19th century, the new era were expanding at the expense of the, uh, of the Dinka, and this is just a little animated map to show how they were spreading. About 19, around 1880, the uh, British uh, colonialists suppressed this uh, warfare that was leading to this uh, 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 conquest, and so it, it stopped about uh, then. And the, according to Kelly, who's reanalyzed this data, the main uh, uh, source of this, the institutional source of this difference was that uh, the, the bride wealth uh, uh, pattern, in, you had to have cows to get married. Uh, these are pastoral societies, herding societies. And so in the uh, new era, you had to have a lot of cows to get married. And, uh, and there was no credit, and the minimum number of cows was high. And the Dinka were much more uh, flexible in there in their bright price uh, system. But the, the upshot in this was that, uh, that uh, the political organization of the, of the new era involved a, a deep segmentary lineages, meaning that you counted your male relatives uh, 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 up and down uh, quite, a, quite deep. Uh, this meant that you, when you needed to assemble these cows to get married, you had lots of uh, male relatives that you could go around and, and ask for help uh, getting your, your bright price together. The Dinka, uh, didn't have that uh, because they didn't need it uh, to the same extent. They lived in territorial groups, but when it came time to mobilizing uh, fighters, the, uh, the uh, New York had routinely uh, mobilized more than twice as many fighters as the uh, Dinka in these intergroup fights. So na naturally, the New York tended to win these fights, and, and based upon the bride price system, according to Kelly, uh, they were winning the, ultimately, the bride price system, they were winning these uh, uh, fights. Uh, don't have too much time left here. So uh, one of, uh, <coughs> of uh, Rob's students years ago looked at warfare in Highland uh, uh, New Guinea, a place where uh, uh, people were still fighting or just had stopped fighting when, when ethnographers got there. So that this is an area where the data on uh, fighting is, is 
is pretty good. And, and so we could estimate uh, extinction rates of uh, groups. So pretty uh, uh, high rates of, of, uh, of group extinctions. Now these are group extinctions, uh, the kind I described before. Not everybody in these groups is killed. The group goes socially extinct, and most of the members of the group filter into other uh, groups where they have friends and relatives. But there's a, a high rate of, of group uh, disappearance, and, and that'll lead to, uh, uh, well, by our, our estimates, this will lead to the, com the replacement of one social institution by another on time scales of about 500 to 1,000 years. So it's a fairly slow uh, uh, process. Uh, the, to get at the institutional part of it, I thought I'd show you some, some data that was collected uh, uh, by uh, one of Rob Boyd's uh, 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 students, uh, uh, Sarah Matthew, uh, pictured here. And so she studied uh, 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 Turkana warfare. This is a, a big tribal group in, in northern uh, Kenya. There are about 600,000 uh, uh, Turkana. And like a lot of pastoral societies, they're into, uh, into cattle raiding. They steal each other, well, they steal other people's cows, and uh, other people raid the uh, uh, Turkana to steal their cows, so there's a defensive and offensive element. It's it gotten, uh, uh, people have gotten AK-47s recently, so this used to be fought out with spears and things. Now it's fought out with uh, automatic rifles. So, so it's a, uh, uh, and it, it still goes on. So Sarah went out to, Turkana land and, and collected a lot of information on, she tried to get information on as many of these uh, uh, fights as possible. So, uh, uh, so she had a, a, uh, a sample of 46 uh, what she called force raids, They're, uh, not to get into the details, but uh, these are fairly large organized raiding parties uh, that uh, uh, go out. And the mean war party had uh, 317 people in it. and. Uh, uh, some of them were, were really quite large. So uh, this, this is an acephalous group, meaning that there are no uh, uh, formal leaders. So this is all organized uh, on the fly, but it's, it's uh, uh, quite uh, heavily institutionalized. And also these uh, people weren't closely related to one another. Many of them weren't at any rate. So uh, uh, the uh, Turkana are divided into territorial uh, sections of about 20,000 uh, 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 people. And war parties, uh, uh, well, they were often composed of uh, warriors from only one uh, of these territorial sections, but they were often composed of uh, people from several different uh, 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 tribal sections. So these are people that are certainly not uh, closely uh, genetically related to one another in lots of cases. And the institutions and norms suppress individual variation. So uh, she asked questions about internal versus external warfare. So how, uh, what do you think of people who uh, stole Turkana, who stole cows from other Turkana versus uh, uh, stole cows from other non-Turkana uh, groups? So uh, <coughs> internal warfare, frankly, everybody thinks that's wrong. Uh, I would be displeased by it. I uh, would criticize people who did it. would punish people who did it. More than uh, well over half of the people indicated that they'd be willing to uh, punish people who engaged in internal warfare. I mean, these are tough guys, so punishing means uh, confronting somebody that's carrying an AK-47. So, uh, and uh, uh, everybody was fine with external warfare. Uh, and then uh, in terms of, uh, of attitudes towards people who engaged in this kind of thing, so most people didn't want to stand near uh, someone who had raided internally in a, in, in a, in a different raid. They wouldn't entrust uh, cows to, uh, other uh, people, they wouldn't lend animals to them, they wouldn't let their daughter marry somebody who was uh, involved in, in internal warfare. So uh, uh, there's strong sanctions then in the system for, uh, uh, for uh, engaging in internal warfare and, uh, uh, but not in external warfare, which is approved. So again, the, the, the individual variation here is suppressed by the by the norms and institution system. So uh, two groups can be quite <laughs> utterly different. So to, uh, just to uh, summarize then, the, uh, the, this idea of gene culture coevolution in human nature, the idea is that uh, we carry these uh, ancient social instincts uh, as a heritage from our primate background, but we also have uh, a human nature that's been remodeled by uh, cultural group selection in, in this argument. Uh, uh, so it's, uh, it's, a, it's a usual, it's an inverse of the usual argument about uh, uh, innate uh, uh, 
mechanisms. So the usual idea is that innate mechanisms evolve before culture and then they control uh, culture. This uh, is uh, E.O. Wilson's famous uh, leash argument that, that uh, culture is on a uh, genetic leash. This argument is that the, uh, there may be a leash all right, but often the dog on the end of the leash is a big dog and so the, the, uh, uh, the uh, cultural dog can drag the genetic uh, uh, owner, so-called, uh, around. Some of you may follow this uh, Marmaduke cartoon. How many people know the Marmaduke cartoon? Marmaduke is a great Dane and, and uh, one of the common sight gags is uh, Marmaduke being taken for a walk by his owner and, and Marmaduke is dragging the owner uh, uh, hither and yon across the, uh, you know, you see people walking their dogs all the time that the, uh, the dog is dragging the person. So uh, uh, this is the idea is that uh, uh, culture is not a passive uh, pet at the end of a leash, it's an active uh, system that can, uh, can change uh, genes. And then this moral <coughs> hidden hand argument. Okay, I think I've finished about on time, so. Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, you do point to, uh, to an important problem. Now, about the fidelity of cultural transmission, at, it, at the limit, I think it, the fidelity gets to, to almost gene-like quality. So think of language. Uh, 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 linguists say we all have our idiolects. Every one of us has a slightly different uh, definition of uh, common words or, or less common words. Uh, on the other hand, to a reasonable approximation, that, that uh, means that we can communicate with one another quite uh, uh, quite effectively, we we have close enough to the same meanings of most words in our heads, so that we uh, can carry on uh, informative conversations, right? So this is so that uh, cultural transmission can have high fidelity. Now, the other uh, uh, point that you make is the complexity of of uh, social institutions and the difficulty. So there there are at least three problems imitating the uh, uh, social organization of another group. Uh, first one is it's hard to observe. So it, it is, as you say, it's complicated. Uh, and part of the, uh, uh, the problem then becomes uh, uh, just observing what's going on. I mean, if you're not part of a uh, culture, you don't really understand the norms and, and institutions that, uh, uh, that they have. And then the other problem with institutions is that uh, you can't just uh, 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 adopt them one, one person at a time, right? You have to get a, a critical mass of people re uh, to uh, uh, together to, to establish a, a new institution and a group. All these things will tend to, to make uh, the uh, transmission of, of institutions fairly ineffective. But even so, then simpler things can be transmitted fairly uh, well. And, and there are nice ethnographic examples. One of our uh, anthropologists at Davis studied a group in, in New Guinea, and th this group uh, uh, was outside the uh, the pig husbandry uh, uh, system. And pig husbandry is a is a big thing because it, 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 pigs are the medium of exchange in the highlands of, 
uh, New Guinea, and being able to raise pigs means that you can enter into this economic uh, uh, system. And so they, they sat down, they had a big meeting, and, and they, uh, enough of them decided, not everybody was, in, uh, was eager for pig raising. Pig raising is mostly uh, women's work, and a lot of the ladies weren't too keen to, to, to get involved with messing around with pigs because it was going to be more work for them. But a, uh, a large enough, a critical mass of people in this uh, group imitated the pig husbandry practices of the neighboring group and, and got pig husbandry going and was able to participate. So at least simpler things do get uh, transmitted, sometimes with, uh, with quite a bit of error. So uh, a really neat example I ran across was the, the German general staff system. Uh, so the German, this is something that developed in the 19th century in, in uh, Germany, in Prussia first. And it was the Prussians and the, uh, were so successful in, uh, in military conflicts in that period that everybody decided they had to have a general staff. And so the, the idea of having a general staff spread to all modern armies in the, in the late 19th and early 20th century. Now, it turned out that uh, uh, a uh, American ex-staff uh, officer, a guy named Trevor Dupuy, uh, uh, actually went back and looked at the history of the German general staff and, and compared it to what uh, the things he'd experienced in the American army. And it turned out we didn't get the, about half the critical things about the German general staff we never got. Uh, uh, so the, uh, nor, nor did other, uh, the Germans weren't any too eager to, to tell people exactly how the, the German general staff operated because it was a sort of semi-secret, but, uh, uh, but it was just hard to observe what the Germans were doing more than anything else. And so it was a partial transmission and, and uh, uh, so that kind of thing goes on. So, so uh, many societies end up with long-term advantages over, over other societies because the, the uh, people that are victims of, the, of, the, of an imperial expansion, for example, can't, uh, can't readily uh, replicate the institutions that are, would be necessary to defend themselves. So the, things like the Han Chinese uh, uh, spread uh, uh, that system uh, horizontally over space and over the millennia. The Roman Empire would be another example. Uh, uh, so uh, very often, so that first form of, of group selection, uh, uh, actual displacement of uh, defeat and displacement and in, maybe incorporation of, of, uh, of other societies is a common uh, pattern just because as what you say is true, that it, it's pretty hard to get institutions from, another, from a successful society even if you want to. I don't know of any uh, uh, a really clear evidence on that, uh, except from language. It, so it's a, uh, a people who study the, uh, the any time languages are in contact, stuff passes back and forth between them. And uh, a rule of thumb is that the two, closer two languages are to one another, uh, the more stuff gets borrowed back and forth. Uh, so uh, when the Danes, uh, the Danish settlers were in England and up next to uh, uh, Anglo-Saxon speakers, uh, uh, early English speakers. There was a lot of because of, uh, Danish and and uh, uh, and uh, English weren't very different in those days. So a lot of uh, loan words got back and forth and, and grammatical constructions and things. So. Do you think that may be changing in modern times because of the means of communication and along across distances and across cultures? Yeah, I think that's an important uh, point too. So uh, uh, before. Uh, ethnographers and, and travelers that reported uh, back. So there's an argument that uh, the West got the uh, uh, got the idea of a rational legal bureaucracy, the Weberian kind of bureaucracy from the Chinese and a, a very exotic society. But uh, the early, uh, I think they were Jesuit uh, visitors and uh, Marco Polo and others. So uh, people were, uh, Europeans were going to China and observing the Chinese system and reporting back uh, uh, to uh, Europe, uh, reasonably accurate depictions of how the how the Chinese bureaucratic system worked, for example, and and so apparently this became uh, uh, part of the uh, intellectual uh, ferment in the uh, in the Enlightenment in the 17th uh, century in Europe, and so the uh, the argument is that we got the idea of the rational legal bureaucracy from the Confucian Chinese uh, system. But, but, but think what is happening in very recent times. You take Spanish with 700 million 
native speakers. You know, they have football, which of course is not our football is soccer, but the football is spelled F-U-T-B-O-L, pronounced as football, so if it's the same word. But so with the language, for example, of the internet and email, and so it's, English, that language yeah. is being incorporated with small modifications, made the Spanish, the verbs are conjugated Spanish way that are English words. So the, the, this communication now is in concept, I think that is reaching much beyond the local boundaries of similarity of language or local geography. Right, and uh, mass media, news, uh, uh, academics, uh, ethnographers and historians and, and uh, political scientists that study foreign cultures and, and bring back uh, and what we think of as reasonably accurate depictions. I think all of this is, uh, uh, must make it much easier to, uh, uh, to move ideas from, uh, from one society to another compared to uh, 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 even a, a few hundred years ago before uh, uh, this, uh, well, the world became globalized in 1492, really didn't it, in a way. We started two minutes late, so we have time for one or two more questions. Um, your, your tribal genetics plays a very important theoretical role in the development. If it was also real, one would expect that it would also mutate over time, <coughs> and isolated uh, areas would develop differently, unless for some reason it had to stop. And I just wonder if there's any evidence for that. I mean, um, uh, the experiment that one would do would be swap children from uh, one from an Aborigine uh, family to a European environment, and uh, you would expect a difference. Yeah, Is well, that ever seen? Yeah, well, it's, it, it's interesting. Of course, we have uh, uh, quite a lot of cross-cultural adoption in the modern world, and I've, uh, I've uh, trolled that literature off and on for years, and, and most of it, uh, there's a certain amount of academic interest in it, but uh, they haven't asked the right questions by my standards. So the, actually, the very best set of data I ever discovered was a historian who uh, uh, went back and looked at these examples of, uh, of white children adopted into Indian families in North America during the, uh, during the frontier period. Uh, uh, there's only newspaper accounts and, and some diaries and reminiscences and things, but it, uh, uh, Europeans were intensely, Anglo-Americans were intensely interested in these cases, and so they were written up in quite a lot of detail in newspapers and things. And, uh, uh, and often these kids were, were uh, adopted when they were pretty young, and the younger they were, the more likely they were to become completely Indian. And so a, a, a famous example is Cynthia Parker was uh, uh, kidnapped from, a, uh, from the Texas frontier when she was uh, four or five years old, six years old, and she was incorporated into uh, the Comanches, and she married a Comanche, young Comanche man who was a, uh, became Quana Parker, the famous chief of the, of the uh, of the Comanches was her son, and uh, uh, she became completely Indian. So when she was about uh, uh, 35 or 40, uh, she was uh, uh, rescued by the uh, Texas Rangers and brought home, and uh, she had a little daughter, and uh, she tried uh, several times to escape and go back to Comanche land, and, and they always uh, dragged her back, and then her daughter died, and then she pined away and died of uh, depression. So uh, uh, that, in, in many other cases uh, like that, well, many, on the order, of, uh, the, the total sample size was on the order of 50. Mostly older kids, sometimes uh, teenagers were incorporated in these societies and their assimilation was much lower. This is the expect from uh, basic child development theory. The exception was two uh, uh, twin boys that were uh, adopted as teenagers and they went 100% over to the Indians. Uh, so uh, they might have had a rough upbringing and, mean father or something, they thought uh, uh, chasing around hunting but animals. Let's have the the somebody else now because the last question, final question. Yes. Quick question. I find that the basic argument about Indonesian cultures and the mechanisms are quite compelling. Uh, on the other hand, I find myself thinking, well, why talk about genetics alone at, at all? I mean, if you know anything about Darwin and you've been writing about <coughs> cultures change and learn and so forth, you know, 300 years ago, would not most of these insights uh, have, have already, uh, you know, or have been viewed as fairly natural? Uh, well, I, 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 I'm 
I say, what, what, what's the role? Are you, are you merely trying to argue that cultures evolve uh, in ways that don't uh, directly require uh, thinking in terms of genetic evolution? Right. Uh, or are you saying there's something you know, that, uh, that genet a really key role here for genetics? Uh, people who don't know squat about Darwin uh, will tell these kinds of stories about how people learn and how groups learn. So, but I, I think that uh, we do have these uh, what, uh, uh, genetic differences between uh, between our ape ancestors and our and ourselves, and I and, and I tried to depict that in, with I, my uh, testes and brain. So our brains got big, our, our testes shrank, and, and so it's it's just these <coughs> are important genetic differences. So uh, the the effort that people make to uh, raise uh, chimpanzee babies to, uh, as if they were human, you don't get. You don't get a, a sort of a dim version of a, of a human out of this. You get a wild animal. Uh, so th there are these genetic differences, and so I think they're important to account for. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.